The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Um, I didn't exactly mean to start on the screen, but uh, hey, why not? Uh, purple is crypto. Um, that's crypto, not just Bitcoin. And these are Z-scores. I believe this is the 365. Yeah, this is a 365-day Z-score for cryptocurrency. So basically, you take the last 365 days, you calculate the moving average, and you calculate the standard deviation. Um, and then you divide, um, you divide how far you are above the moving average, above or below, by the standard deviation. So it tells you how many standard deviations are you away from the average. So one standard deviation um, includes, so on the, that center point there, you see the gray line, that's zero. Um, if you go one standard deviation down and one standard deviation up, that includes 66% of all data. If you go two standard deviations up or down, that includes 95%. Um, and then three standard deviations is like 99%. So um, at this moment, in terms of um, the last 365 days, crypto is um, is is basically at three standard deviations. So we have not had price performance to the top side in general for the total crypto market cap. Um, we're in like the one percentile here. We're like at the very, very top. You'll notice that um, effectively we are very close to previous bull markets. Now, you might say, OK, well, 365 days is a little bit arbitrary. Um, maybe we could go 730 days, right? So two years approximately, almost exactly. So if we do that, you'll notice we're still a little bit, um, lower than, than previous, um, previous all time high bull markets, previous blow off tops. Um, you know, that's, um, so again, it is a little bit arbitrary, which timeline you want to select for, but, uh, at any way you slice it, crypto is performing right now. At, at a very kind of like out of trend area, like it's very, very high. Um, so uh, we we kind of started here with the Z-scores. I didn't really quite intend to start there. Um, but hey, you know, why not? As long as we're here, let's go ahead and take a look at, um, let's take a look at stocks as well. Um, particularly, this is the, the uh, I think it's the NASDAQ. Oh, hang on. Let me check what I did in here. Uh, yeah, that's the NASDAQ. Uh, so blue is NASDAQ, and um, I mean, you'll notice that stocks just tend to perform to the top side on Z-scores anyways, which is kind of weird. <laughs> You're like, how can you all, you should be centered about zero, um, but they just manage to keep pushing stocks up all the time. So stocks are basically always above the moving average. Um, not always, but they tend to be. So this was the bull, uh, the bear market recently. Um, as long as we're here on the screen, let's go ahead and quickly cover macro. Um I don't think it's necessarily a good idea to talk about crypto and, and the overall markets here without having the backdrop of macro. It makes sense to do that. So um, right here, we're looking at Dixie. Nothing special on this chart. We're basically trending sideways. Touch the upper standard deviations there. Um, so nothing special to look at in, in terms of Dixie. In terms of the reverse repos, we had another big sell-off, right? We basically went from um, five and a half trillion, or sorry, uh, uh, five. $550 billion um, and now sitting about $440 billion. So um, yeah, on Friday, a bunch of money came out reverse repos. Again, <clears throat> this is, um, this is effectively cash that can, that can leave sort of like a place of safety being parked overnight with the federal reserve, getting the overnight federal funds rate effectively. Um, and so as that money comes out, that's basically risk on, right? This, these are people moving this money into places that they think will make them higher yield. Um, and, and have like a better risk adjusted return uh, for their firms or for whatever their company or corporation is, um, their investment firms, whatever, all of the institutional players that keep their money here in the reverse repos. This, once we start getting down to the zero point, that's when we start saying, hey, this run is potentially looking at being over, right? Like we need to, that's where you want to start saying, okay, let's protect our bags. I know I've been saying for months now, I've been saying, hey, I'm looking for exits. I'm looking for exits and I'm still looking for exits. I haven't sold anything um, because it's kind of like uh, maybe we'll talk about we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but um, you know this is what I mean when I say okay tentatively this is what I'm I'm looking at here coming into the future, um, but as we get closer we have to play it by ear right you always have to adjust in, in real time and continuing to look at these markets week by week I look at them and I say why am I going to sell here that doesn't make sense stay in the market stay in the market um, but I couldn't I couldn't chase like I was unable to get myself to chase these markets higher even though I have plenty of capital sitting on the side. 
um, in case things crash, right? Like I've kind of been hoping for a nice big fat crash and I could just scoop up some, some cheap prices. Um, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that, right? Like that's, that's a decision that I make. Um, that's my trading style. I don't chase markets. I get in at the bottom. I sell the top. Um, that works for me. Um, but there's a lot of other trading styles that can work for people. So, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So anyways, um, yeah, the point on this chart, the reverse repos are still coming to the downside. It still looks like there's juice to squeeze. There's still upside here, um, to be had. So in that same vein, we can also look at, um, we can look at the global liquidity situation. Let me, this is the NASDAQ also that we're looking at. So one thing you'll notice here on the NASDAQ, it just put on another all-time high. Um, but they made it, I don't know why they changed this on TradingView, but they made it difficult to find. I can never remember where this button is. There's a place to um, hide. There we go. There's a place to hide the, um, the NASDAQ because we don't really care about that. We don't want to look at that. Um, let's also hide the indicators. Okay, there we go. The white line is global liquidity. The green line is U.S. liquidity, right? And so this is... This is basically a, um, this is all of the M2 money supply across. So in the white line case, the global liquidity, this is the M2 money supply across all the different major currencies that matter accounting for like, and so this script, I put, I think like 99% of the, of the currency market cap, right? So effectively all of the M2 SL, which includes cash checking savings, um, and time deposits of less than a year. So like if you've got a money market account, where um, your deposit maturity length or CD where your maturity length is less than one year, that's all wrapped up into what they call M2 money supply. So um, effectively, uh, the white line includes all the M2 money supply and the central bank balance sheets, right? Because as central banks expand their balance sheet, that's money that that goes into the various economies. So right now we're, we're effectively looking at um, flat global liquidity. It, this is also a delayed chart. You have to understand this is delayed by at least a month or two. Um, because it takes time for them to report the M2 money supply, which is actually really annoying. Um, it would be much better if we could see that in real time. I'm sure there's probably reasons why they don't like to report that. I'm sure they have a good excuse why they don't report it in real time. Anyways, um, you'll notice that, again, we've talked about this chart for a while. Uh, U.S. Federal Reserve liquidity, or sorry, U.S. total liquidity is coming up. Um, into the U.S. total liquidity is wrapped up uh, the reverse repos. Um, the other chart we were looking at as reverse repos go up, the liquidity goes down because that's that's basically liquidity coming off of the market. That's just general cash coming out of the general economy, getting locked up into uh, into those reverse repos. And then when money comes out of the reverse repos, that money can go somewhere else. It can be it, it, it will seek a home. It will seek a place to go. So um, it's it's inverse to, to this liquidity anyway. So things are basically flat on the liquidity, liquidity situation there. Um, but they could be going up uh, de depending on what's happening with the M2 money supply right now that we won't know for the next two months until they finally report the, the data. Um, okay, but anyways, macro situation just overall looks like they're still juiced to squeeze here. Uh, I really, really, really headline the um, the reverse repos. That's that's so important. That basically told us that the bear market was incipient um, as, that, as that was coming to the upside here um, back in 2021. Uh, okay, and then last, we'll look at gold. Uh, turn back all of our pleb lines, which are magical and special and sort of tell you stuff. <laughs> I know it looks dirty. It's, uh, what are you going to do though? Hey, I mean, these are, this is the weekly chart. So some of these lines look a little bit dirty, but, um, just, you know, ignore the, those lines, the headliner stuff that we're looking at here is that big triangle that we've been looking at since forever. And we'll be looking at probably for a long time until it breaks. Maybe this thing breaks now, like gold, it feels like gold has some catching up to do in my mind. A lot of the markets have just really, really pumped. Um, okay, uh, gold did pump first. Gold pumped early. Um, you know, coming in, coming from the bottom here last year, pumped up pretty good. Uh, at least for gold, you know, like twenty seven percent is a pretty significant move for gold. Um, you know, it's still kind of consolidating here. I mean, it's on the top side, right? This is bullish. This looks bullish for gold. Um, but all the gold bucks are sitting here waiting and watching the rest of the markets pass them by. Nasdaq is just continuing to to pump out gains. So um, my suspicion here on the way that they like to play these. Um, the way that they like to play gold, the way they like to suppress it, like they, they like to do stuff. Um, I'm going to have to imagine that when gold is finally, finally going to get ready to break out of this triangle, that's probably when the market's going to crash, right? Everyone's going to be like, hey, gold looks like it's great. It might even pop up here to the upside for a minute. And then all of the markets crash together and then they'll buy themselves some more time for this chart pattern to keep uh, to keep wiggling around before before it finally breaks out. That's just how they play it, right? That's what they do with assets that they hate, that they despise. They do it to gold. They do it to Monero. So um, again, like it's a long-term play. Gold is a way of like storing value, of keeping your value with the occasional opportunity that it could that it could smash to the upside. 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen anytime soon. Again, we've talked about for months, really for a year, this chart is a very long-term chart, right? It doesn't actually come to a real head here until 2025. And maybe even 2026, if you really wanted to draw it as, as big as you possibly could. Usually these kind of um, rising triangles, um, they don't they don't typically wait until the last second to pop. They'll they'll usually pop early. Um, so probably 2025, you know, maybe um, I, guess, I guess we'll just wait and see. Uh, nothing, nothing happened with bonds. Still flat. Right. We'll just kind of skip over this chart. Still inverted, but um, trending sideways. Bond markets stable. Um, and that's important. Right. When bonds are stable, that has the opportunity for risk assets to pump. You don't want bonds pumping massively. You don't want them crashing a bunch. You just want them stable. And that's where they're at for, for the meantime. Um, quickly, again, just uh, boring fucking <laughs> boring um, NASDAQ and, and uh, stock stuff. The S&P put on new all-time highs on Friday, as did the NASDAQ, um, new all-time highs. As we've talked about, we are looking particularly to get, we are looking for stocks to make these purple bands to the upside here, right? We're looking for price to get into this into this range right there, um, and overall, like this will form a channel that gives stocks like the ability to keep rising. Um, with again, with some washouts here, right? Like you come, imagine we come to the top side, um, stocks make it up here, and then and then the S and P crashes like thirteen percent, right? Or hell, maybe it even crashes like twenty percent. Um, that could happen, right? Like on some kind of like risk off um, tail risk event demand destroying event, whatever, however you want to call it, there could be some like random bullshit that happens. And then they come in, they intervene, they rescue the markets, right? You could see a 20% crash. Um, that's, that wouldn't be out of the question. I, I would love to see it. Actually, I would, I would love to see a big crash on the markets. Um, but even a 20% crash, oops, sorry. Uh, even a 20% crash on the S and P let's go to the weekly so that we have more context. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even a 20% crash from somewhere around this area, uh, down to like right around there, right? Like that, that's still nothing like that's still, okay. That's not quite as high as, as the bull market left off at 2021, but when, and they do this, I think that this is a new strategy that they learned with COVID crap. I'm not supposed to say that word. I'm sorry, Doug. Um, they'll pump the markets up before the major crash so that like the bottom of the crash really isn't that bad. Like this bottom here during the mm, March, 2020 events, was just only slightly lower than that previous crash that happened in 2019 or was that 2018 at the end of 2018. So it's like they often before a major crash will irrationally pump the markets above like really the levels where they should be. Um, and that might be what we're looking at here. I don't want to like necessarily call a crash that the signs are there, the inversion of the yield curve, et cetera. It's all there, but you know, it, when is that going to happen? I don't know. Well, it's, it's there, the potential for it exists, but we just haven't seen the signs that it's in progress or, or that it's about to start. So, um, that that's the macro backdrop that we're looking at. Um, <clears throat> just a couple more things here. We got finally, finally got new numbers for the M2SL as of January 1st, right? So we're delayed by two months here. Um, the M2SL hasn't climbed up at all. Um, it may have climbed up the past two months. Um, let's see unemployment. No, nothing here is, is interesting. Okay. So, uh, that's the macro. That's our backdrop. That's what we're looking at. Like, it looks like there's liquidity, you know, summary here. It looks like there's liquidity. There's still reverse repos. Bonds are stable. Like, Everything still says up, like the direction still says, hey, pumps can happen. Um, crypto's, you know, gone quite far. It maybe needs to take a little consolidation here. We'll see. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but overall, like the big the big picture macro, it says up. There's liquidity in the markets. There's there's um, there's juice to squeeze. So, uh, like well, I said, I'm looking for exits, but I'm not exiting just yet. What's up? Well, what, what do you think that the story is right now with Bitcoin as to as to why it's going up? I mean, other than, other than the charts... Um, what do you think the the reasoning is behind it? Yes, yeah, so, I it, mean, it's, you know that it's the happening, the ETF, or is it as simply you know the 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 broader markets going up, and so, and so is so is Bitcoin. It's all of the above. Um, you know, one thing that um, maybe was lost on me for for a quick minute there when the ETF was released is that this ETF is different. Um, like when they released the last, so to answer your question, it's all of the above, right? Everything like you got the narratives, you've got the plebs, everyone's excited about Bitcoin, you've got the ETF. Now you've got normies that can, um, they can buy Bitcoin on the stock market. They could have bought it before, but it wasn't the same thing. Buying Grayscale, which has the, have this like weird divergence of their net asset value to the actual traded price, like that, that, that didn't feel natural and it wasn't like completely, fully, wholly sanctified and blessed. And then the futures ETF that got released in 2021 was a derivative product, not a spot tracking of the Bitcoin price. And there was also very high fees with that ETF. Um, I 
I think they personally milked this shit for all they could. Like, I think they milked the ETF and this entire saga was probably pre-planned. Um, Gary Gensler was probably in on it from the very fucking beginning um, to, uh, to, 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 the like slow as slowly as possible with as much hype as possible integrate Bitcoin into the stock market. Gensler was positive crypto before he got into the SEC. He's just playing a role, guys. He's not he's not anti crypto. He's just like positive. Make as much money as I can on the inside um, while approving shit. Um, that's that's probably. I mean, that's my ninety percent thesis on what this dude is and and what's going on here. Okay, so the this ETF is different. This ETF is different because it is literally the spot price of Bitcoin. They 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 are forced to buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, depending on the demand that they're experiencing. So you got like 10 different ETF products. They're all spot products. As, as people buy Bitcoin or as people buy these ETFs, those ETFs have to hold the Bitcoin that is being bought, right? That's why the custodian is Coinbase. I think for the most of them, it's, it's Coinbase. So as people are buying Bitcoin on the stock or buying the ETFs on the stock market, that's real buying pressure that happens in in the actual Bitcoin exchange market, right? And the actual real spot Bitcoin market is represented there, um, more or less. I mean, are there shenanigans going on behind the background? Pr probably. My guess is right now they want to look clean. They're not gonna. They're not gonna be doing like their little fraud, um, fractional reserve bullshit. They're not gonna do that right out the gate. Like that wouldn't make any sense for them. They need to make it look like they're running you know, completely honest above board, right? Like anyone that investigates any, anyone looking under the, under your fingernails here, isn't going to find anything. We're totally clean. Um, do they, do I, they have proof of funds at Coinbase? I think so. I don't remember if they were one of those guys that did it, but I mean, you can bet your bottom dollar that on the regulator side of things here, they're, they're, they have the, they have the Bitcoin they're saying they're not fractionally mm -hmm. reserving Bitcoin with these ETFs right now. Maybe in the future they'll do it. I don't know, but I can't see any reason why they would want to do that. They love Bitcoin. Like they love the surveillance. They love the fact that that it's not scalable, that their scaling plans have failed, utterly failed for seven years. They love the fact that it's total distraction from actual digital freedom money. They want to keep the price up. They want to keep you distracted. So why would they fractionally mm -hmm. reserve it? No, no. They're pumping the price. They're leveraging up the price. Um whether Coinbase, I, I haven't checked that. Um mm -hmm. my guess is they've got something, but I mean, I don't know. They, they've at least, they, they, at least by law, technically, they're required to hold the Bitcoin on behalf of those ETFs. And you have to think, if you're one of these 10 big ETFs, are you really going to keep your 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 ETF funds in Coinbase who who doesn't actually have those funds? Like, there's, I mean, Coinbase is like one of the most, you know, integrated, blessed, holy exchanges, you know, regulated exchanges and on the planet. So I just have to believe that at least for now. Um, they've got to be there. It's very, very likely that they're honest about the Bitcoin that they have, um, for, for these ETFs holding on behalf of the ETFs. Um, I mean, uh, do you, you, th you think we get to some kind of point where the, uh, Bitcoin creates a uh, systemic risk throughout the entire economy because there's just, uh, you know, so many people starting to kind of rely on it. Mm, no, uh, not in a, not in a real sense. Um, like it might get blamed for systemic risk, but I don't really see. I don't really see how that could happen at the moment. Um, I mean, of course, like all kinds of fraud and shenanigans, you know, can develop um, over the course of years, and perhaps some kind of. Um, usually, the thing that creates systemic risk for the economy is leverage, <laughs> is excessive mm -hmm. print of, printing of money and leverage. Um, of uh, of have having misvalued assets, um, overvalued assets that are that use other assets as collateral and insurance. That but the, but the the other thing too is like like Bitcoin is just is really just pure speculation, you know. So it, it's I mean, it's not built on the utility of Bitcoin is store of value. So it, it's it's really not resting on. It's like it's kind of a house of cards in that respect, in my opinion. Well, um, I mean, because we would it's say lacking that, that base so, utility. We would we would like to say that about a lot of things that like a lot of stuff is built on house of cards, but it just seems to keep going. So, um, like the price, I as long as enough people believe it and enough of the inside cabal and power structure wants wants it and wants to keep it propped up, like it's going to stay there. It's it's um, you know it might have like it, it. It's hard to say that it doesn't have some kind of store value properties. Store of value would more appropriately mean that you're not going to suffer 70% losses over the course of six months. <laughs> um, 
But, uh, you know, it's, it's volatile. It's a speculative asset. That's what it is. Bitcoin facilitates speculative value gains that far exceed inflation, um, that, that even exceed the stock market. That's what its use case is. It's, it's not even store of value. Store of value is just a, a way to, to hide the degeneracy of what's actually going on there. Um, like gold is a store of value. It's, it's hard. Like that's a, that's a loose term, you know, like everything has volatility, but, um, I mean, 5% yielding bonds, you know, you could call that a store of value, I guess. Um, cause they're stable, right? They're very stable. They're going to be worth about what you put into them. They're some of the most stable assets on the planet. Um, I mean, it's like, there are aspects of Bitcoin that are store of value, but let's be real. It's, it's, it's more about the speculation, uh, everyone that says that. They're, they're those. They're all talking about hyper Bitcoinization. They're all talking about million dollar Bitcoin and and that hundred trillion dollar valuation is is bearish, right? Like, it's just Man, I, I don't know. Can it's just, it's so just much money in this stuff. What's that? <laughs> only so much like, money can go into it. Yeah, I mean, okay. that, that's you, could true. O- you could only double so many more times, right? Like that's the other exactly. Thing. Like pe- well, people are a- people are aping into it, thinking they're they're gonna make you know big gains. I mean, it's at some point you just it's too big to grow. Well, you know, being honest, um, Bitcoin has made some pretty big gains here. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, they they've definitely it's it's definitely served its purpose for that uh, you know for that number go up use case. It's been one of the better coins, right? Let's check out the dominance here real quick. You know, Bitcoin dominance. Um, as you mentioned, Tex, you know, like still kind of hanging out here at, at pretty decent, pretty reasonably high levels. Um, at this point, I'm not, I'm not really sure if we should expect necessarily this, this will go down. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit more about this ETF um, and about altcoins. Um, so as we said, this ETF is different than the other financial inclusion products, like when the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in 2017, December 17, 2017, um, added it, added Bitcoin futures. Those futures are settled in cash, U.S. dollars, not Bitcoin. The first ETFs in 2021 were a derivative product on the basis of the futures product, but did not settle real Bitcoin. This is the first time that a real inclusion in the financial market um, is required to buy real Bitcoin on the open market, on the spot market. So, like, you do have, you definitely have normies coming in here, um, mom and pops, everyone buying this ETF. Everyone's talking about it. You can see anecdotally people are talking about it. I still question, like, I know this crypto cabal. I know how they operate. I still question how much of these inflow volumes are real legitimate volume and how much is just wash trading, right? How much is, um, is just the crypto cabal buying ETF, um, and just like wash trading there, you know, to try and like simulate volume. That's, that's how they operate. That's how they've done things the entire time. Um, and they seem to operate fairly with with a significant amount of impunity, even on the, the highly regulated exchanges. So. I think that some component of this volume that has been coming into the ETFs is probably just wash trading, but um, there is a significant component that is real. Otherwise, the price couldn't have gone up the way that it did. Um, like, they front run the price when like small amounts of real buying cause outsized um, movements of the price, and that's that's basically a front running mechanism. It's also um, a distribution mechanism. So. Um, Bitcoin has a heavily centralized supply. It's held by an, like a pretty small cabal. Like no matter what the maximalists want to say, like the supply of Bitcoin is extremely centralized, and these guys have a lot of Bitcoin that they want to distribute onto the world, and um, and they're doing a good job of it. They <laughs> they really are. Um, they want to distribute at the highest prices. So because Bitcoin has this ETF and is able to absorb all these funds, um, that really puts a lot of focus on Bitcoin, which is why you know the dominance is, has maintained uh, just above fifty percent here. However, um, it's also a clear thing to me that. The crypto ecosystem has a certain amount of cash. Um, the, uh, the the crypto ecosystem has like a certain amount of cash that's involved in it, um, wrapped up into it. And that's why like crypto prices go up and down together is because there's a certain amount of cash, uh, like real US dollars in the system, uh, and that cash can be used to leverage up the price and, and can be used at certain levels to support the price. So um, yeah, I mean, there is cash coming into the system. Ultimately, that cash goes onto the exchanges to represent the buying that's happening on the ETF. So that is cash that could be used to pump altcoins here at some point. Um, so I, I'm not really decided on whether we get a massive, massive alt run. We should still continue to get an alt run. Some of these coins are performing pretty well. Um, they're basically like at this moment, um, a lot of them are kind of at parity with Bitcoin in terms of where they came from the bottom, like when they bottomed in the markets and, and at the top, they're either at parity, a little below, a little below, uh, a little above, just depends. Um, let's see here. I'm no BTC maxi, but the last comment feels like coping, bro. Listen, <laughs> There's Last no segment. Coping. Yeah, I don't know what he's. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what he's even. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. What like, do you think he's referring not, to there? 
we're not like I don't know. I'm not quite sure what anything I've said here is cope. It's like mm. I've been saying for months the direction is up. So the, like here, here's the thing, thing too. Like um, this is this is good in my opinion. I mean I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm pretty sure you share this opinion, buddy. Uh, this is this is good for Monero. I mean this is where Monero is ultimately going to be getting its liquidity from. It's like the the trunk of the tree is growing, and we're and you know we're one of the branch one of the main branches off of it. Uh, and this is this is how we get value into Monero. It's gonna mostly come from Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, I I can only like half agree with that statement because the other half is that where's the liquidity coming from right now? It's coming from the stock market, right? That that's not people, that's not mom and dad and regular people normies buying cryptocurrency and holding yeah but the but the the normie the people that already have Bitcoin their their value in Bitcoin is going up. Right, and they're 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 further understanding the value proposition of crypto itself. They're realizing they might want to hedge, you know, and, and store something that's more unconfiscatable. Um, and what do they do? They move a little Bitcoin into Monero. I don't know. That's that would be my overall uh, bullish thesis on why every Monero user should be happy about Bitcoin going up and working as a as a number go up coin because you know we're, we're getting cut off from the traditional exchanges right there's the eventually there will be no centralized exchange that you could buy monero with with fiat so it's the value is going to come from other cryptos into monero in a in a very very broad sense and like the changing of um the philosophy of a generation or, or of the world yes um, more people are saying, okay, you know, this Bitcoin thingy, this idea of a shared distributed ledger, this makes sense. Okay, I, I get it. Yeah, you know what? There's a lot of printing going on. Uh, maybe we should like have a monetary system that uh, that doesn't involve printing or at least has a known issuance, a, a known supply schedule issuance. Um, yeah, in a, in a broad sense, it, it is changing like the fabric of society. The, the minds of people are saying, uh, okay, you know, I, I guess it's legitimate. A lot of the no coiners, the haters over the years, are they're being forced to reevaluate their own shit because now they either have to admit that their government is um, <laughs> that their government is fraudulent by putting Bitcoin into the into the main financial system um, and making really bad decisions, or they have to say, oh well, maybe Bitcoin is uh, you know maybe it is legitimate, right? Um, so yeah, in a, in a big broad sense, yes, like people are coming around to that idea that okay, maybe we could do money a different way, and that will have positive effects for, for Monero. In terms of the short term, like what does this do for Monero adoption today? I'm not quite sure how much. It, I think the Binance deal listing probably did more for Monero adoption in terms of like just mentally like street cred um, than, yeah, than yeah, what Bitcoin yeah. is doing here. Um, but in the long term sense, yeah, I would I would totally agree with you in, in that case. I mean, just um, just an anecdotal story. I was talking to a guy the other day, very very wealthy individual, older gentleman. Um, he might even be like his his late mid to late seventies. Um, and he's been an investor for, he's, he's a doctor who, uh, also, you know, kind of, kind of learned investing at an early age and, um, got his uh, trading license or whatever. And so in addition to being a doctor, he, he, tr he's been trading his whole life and he's, he's made a lot of money. Um, he's, you know, very, very aware of Bitcoin, very interested in Bitcoin. And, um, I think he's, you know, he probably bought some of the ETF, and I, I told him about Monero. He had he had heard the name, but didn't really know much about it. And I exp you know explained the value proposition, and he was like, "Wow, yeah." He's like, "I thought that's what I thought." Literally, basically saying, "I thought that's what Bitcoin was." Um, and it got to the point. He was like, "Well, how do I get some? You know, I want to I want to you know buy a nice chunk of Monero." And that's when you realize there's, there is no easy, you know, there's no easy way to ape into Monero in a big way. Um, you know, Kraken, but we're, we're in New York. So, I mean, there, there's New York financial capital of the world. It's, there's, there's no easy way for people here to be like, I'm going to throw a hundred grand into Monero. I'm going to throw a million dollars into Monero. Um, and that way, I think, is going to eventually become through other other cryptos because I just I just don't see it happening in the other direction, right? Yeah, um, yeah, it is it is pretty unfortunate that um, that things have developed that way. It, it does slow the progress of people into Monero. Um, there's no doubt about that. 
Let me ask uh, you, what, actually, would, what would you tell somebody, like uh, a person who's looking to uh, invest in Monero, right? We, we, we usually don't talk about it in those terms, right? We talk about using it. But the fact is, people see, people see utility in it. They're understanding it. Uh, they might want to buy a chunk, a chunk of Monero. What would, you, what's your like general advice to people that want to put like a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars into Monero? Like, what would you tell somebody who wanted to do that in the easiest way possible for like a noob? Um, uh, obviously, I would say Kraken, but if you're in New York, you've got to jump through some other hoops. Like, if you want to drop a million dollars and of your, let's suppose your, you know, high net worth doctor, you know, sixty years old, something like that, you want to drop a million dollars into Monero. I mean, Kraken is the way to do it. You get on their OTC desk. I say, hey, I want to drop a million into Monero, whatever. Um, you take a lot of precautions. You, you probably hire someone. Like at that level, you hire somebody to make sure that you've got your security set up well to like review your stuff. Um, maybe you even do, um, uh, I don't know. You, you probably involve your lawyer in that as well. Um, 100,000 isn't, isn't quite as big a deal, right? Um, for 100,000, you could slowly acquire that on local Monero. Um, I mean, I, I would give you options, right? Like my, my advice to someone wanting to do that, it would be to give them options and really first ask them questions. What's their technical competency? Like what's their age? What's their, um, what's their, uh, yeah, you know, like fi fi figure somebody that's like you know doing online trading using Robinhood, whatever. They're using uh, Charles Schwab. They're used to those things. They know how to go online. They have their bank account connected to their Charles Schwab, and they're buying stocks. That that archetype of person, which I think is the average kind of investor these days. How does yeah, that I mean, person who is sitting on a portfolio of ten million dollars says, you know what? I'll buy I'll buy 500k of Monero right now, but there's um, no yeah, I mean, right now. There's no there's no hit the button. You know, it's like yeah. it's 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 a big. It's always been it's always been an issue with Monero. That time you know during the the 2017 2018 time that probably was the easiest time to get Monero. It was on Poloniex. It was on big exchanges. You know, big the big exchanges of the day. Uh, and then there were, there were a lot of other, you know, kind of KYC free exchanges at that time. They haven't been cracked down on yet. Um, but now it's, it, you know, it's, it's even harder to kind of ape into Monero, which we're all aware of. And we, 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 talk about the benefits of, uh, it's allowing Monero to, to grow out in the wild. Um, but the reality is, I don't know. I feel like we, we need some solutions there. I don't know. I don't know what to tell people right now, bro. There's no like this is a problem that's plagued cryptocurrency since forever. If you want to actually use it in a sovereign way, there is no smash a button. There is no custodian that you make an account and uh, you know you just sign up. No, but I mean, Monero, like, Monero on Coinbase you have to manage is, your private is, keys. There's like no other. There's no other way. I'm I'm talking about smash a button for obtaining, right? Like we we, we talk about how it's not. It's obviously local. Monero is the ideal way to obtain. You do it with cash, whatever. Um, but I see value in people being able, to, personally, I see value in people being able to buy it on centralized exchanges. Um, I know we like Binance, yeah, it probably was doing more harm than good. But something like a Coinbase, if people could hit the, you know, the ape in button and buy 100 grand worth of Monero and then learn to take it off the exchange, I, th I, I personally think that that's a great thing, great for adoption. Yeah, I mean, there's a, um, and, a and it's better than buying any other crypto more. on a centralized exchange. At least you're buying Monero and you're pulling cash out of a bank account. You know, at the end of the day, when you pull it off the exchange. Yeah, I mean, you know, what are you gonna do, right? <laughs> you live in New York. Uh, you're you're gonna have a harder time getting into Monero. There's no doubt about it. Yep, yep. I just feel like I don't know. There's not enough conversation around those things, and I and I also feel like maybe kind of the Monero community assumes that's just the way it needs to be. But may, maybe there's obviously Cake is is always working on things in this direction, and they they've come a really long way. I mean, Cake is pretty impressive at this point. You can tell people just download Cake, uh, and they could effectively figure out how to obtain Monero from that. But uh, I mean, Tux, correct me if we're wrong, though. We're, we're not at the point where you could easily, I think maybe in Europe, right, you could connect your bank account and essentially purchase Monero? Are there? Yeah, so uh, people who are in the, the European economic regions are 
blessed because they have this this nice service called DFX, and they let you buy up to 990 euros of Monero or any other crypto on their platform. KYC free. Uh, uh, every KYC hours. free. Yeah, KYC. Now it, you have to use a bank account, and some people will argue, "Oh, that's KYC." Well, technically, it's right. not. KYC is a a bank process. It's a it's a process where they have to take your information, like ID with selfie and stuff. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. What are the fees? What are the fees? What are the fees? Um, like? I don't know, but I don't believe they're very high. Um, maybe it's like like one percent, two percent, something like that. So one of the one of the cheaper ways to obtain yeah Monero DFX protection. is a great option and I've heard from several people who live in those areas and use it they're like yeah it's pretty great um, so hmm. now do you do you guys see that potentially growing in terms of jurisdiction that uh, DFX yeah DFX or yeah or just in general like Cake figuring out other partners to partner up with where they you'd have that same same uh, effect elsewhere or is you think it's just I mean gonna be potentially kind of your... um, DFX initially. Um, I think they want it to be like integrated. Like they, they contacted Cake to be integrated, but Vic made them add Monero before he would let them <laughs> uh, be part of Cake Wallet. So, um, mm, okay, which is which is cool because uh, they didn't have Monero before. Um, other, I mean, maybe it'll expand to other places. Maybe there'll be other ones for some reason, and I don't I don't know exactly why. U.S. companies, and I think some of this is due to like. The whole all the regulatory stuff going on with crypto u.s companies are like afraid like even though they could if they want to they they don't they don't host privacy coins anymore right the only one is kraken in the u.s and then in order to mm -hmm. even withdraw from kraken it's full kyc mm -hmm. so the u.s i don't see anything like that coming soon yeah uh, you you've never been able to obtain monero in new york via bank account by a centralized exchange, never in the history of crypto. Oh, like is... never ever, like not even like five years ago. No, never ever. It's never wow. been listed on any exchange that that's accessible by New York. Um, you know, even Poloni Poloniex wasn't uh, accessible by 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 New York. That's crazy. Um, yeah, you know, it's crazy. I mean, it's it, it definitely played a very large role in keeping uh, liquidity out of an era. I believe. I believe. Yeah, on that, that, that's a better way to put it. It's KYC yeah. light, not KYC free. If yeah. you do, if you do, I mean, that's a lot though. Nine hundred. So could, could somebody like could that could that be a, a way like you know this is this isn't uh, advice to anybody to do it, but like open a bank account in Europe and like you transfer money to it, and then you can with that bank account start buying buying Monero. Uh, I mean, I I don't know what goes into could it effectively... overseas bank account in a European country. I, I don't know. I don't, that that, I don't think Can't it's that hard say, or crazy to do. Uh, yeah, I don't think you that, can do that. that. Then maybe that's that maybe that's totally a way to do it. Mm. That's definitely not the normy easy way, though. Just hey, open the app, connect your bank account. Yeah, oh, sorry, you got to set one. <laughs> no, up no, <laughs> halfway around the world. Uh, yeah. All right, buddy. What else? What else you got, man? I got a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> I slowed you down. I'm sorry. I, I had some questions today. Listen, if you're if you're a high net worth individual in New York and you want to purchase Monero, what you need to do is um, honestly the, the only way I can really think to do this. You need to take your um, 401k or your um, your Roth IRA, and you need to take control of that. Right? You need to either create the corporation or, or hire a corporation that does those management of funds because you need like a separate shell company entity to hold those funds for you and incorporate it in a jurisdiction that can get onto Kraken. Right? You'll, you'll need mm -hmm. some help, mm -hmm. but this is a very common thing that people do. People do this all the time, right? They, they take control of their IRA. Um, they do the, uh, you know, they do the extra corporate entity um, incorporated in a jurisdiction that has Kraken and then wire the funds and, and then buy, buy Monero that way and like slowly plus up that mm -hmm. way. Obviously, in that case, you're limited to how much you can buy every year. Um, I don't remember what those limits are. They're actually not that high, but um, that is one way, right, that you could probably, because now it's that that legal entity that's holding those funds on your behalf is the entity that's actually buying them. Um, it might be the case that you could transfer maybe, um, so once you transfer all those funds to the entity, you might be able to roll those funds. Um, like you might have a bunch of stocks, right? Maybe you've got like 5 million in stocks or something. Um, and you're going to transfer a lot of that that's in your Roth IRA currently, right? You could, you could sell those stocks and then buy Monero, right? You're just like transferring um, 
out of out of those stocks into Monero, and then rebuy those stocks in some other like in some other um, account that you might have, like to to keep that balance the same while plussing up your Monero stash. That's that's probably what I would recommend. Um, you know, I obviously wouldn't be the guy to like tell you exactly how to do that, but there's like that's a common thing to do. People have done the Bitcoin Roth IRA for a long time now, so it's just a matter of doing it with Monero this time. So that's really like for a high net worth individual, that's probably what I'd, what I'd recommend. <laughs> I like this. I think getting lots of Monero is easy. Step one, go to Columbia, buy lots of cocaine. Step two, pay CIA stooge to fly to Meta, Arkansas. Step three, pay off the Clinton mafia to let you land it. <laughs> All right. That is one way. That's probably the easiest way. That's one way to commit suicide on accident, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see here. Let me look at my notes. What do we got going on? Okay, today we're going to look at the regression analysis also. I got a lot of requests for that. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to... Let's talk about Monero because I'm sure that people want to hear about Monero. There's yes. obviously there's not too much to say. So we'll, we'll stop on Monero here real quick. Um, take a look and then we'll talk. We'll go back to Bitcoin. We'll go back to like the broader crypto markets and look at the regression analysis. Uh, let's see. We, we got we got 55 people viewing right now. Like and share, guys. Let's get, let's get the numbers up. Let's grow the audience. I feel like uh, sometimes I feel like we're shadow banned. Like people don't get the alert. Put your alerts on on YouTube, by the way. I think that helps. It helps us grow the show. Go ahead, man. Take it away. So one thing that um, that didn't escape me and I posted about this earlier this week is that you guys remember 2021, January 1st, 2021, when Bittrex, a no volume exchange, delisted Monero with a whole lot of like negative press. And everyone's like, oh, my God, they're going to they're just going to ban it. And like they did that to hit the price on Monero as hard as they could while they were planning on pumping everything else. Right. Incipient to the to the pump that was happening, like mid pump. And then a few months later, everything topped. Everything hit a blow off top a lot sooner than anyone expected it would. And everything crashed. Right. Um Man, this this story that happened recently doesn't just rhyme. It's like the same fucking story. It's the exact same play that they did in 2021. So, um, so yeah, the, the delisting of Monero was like a sign, was another little tick mark in the direction of, hey, there's more gains to be had here. Um, and right now, it's another tick mark in the direction of, is there a blow-off top happening sooner rather than later? Remember, we've talked about on this show before, markets learn. So things get front run. When a pattern gets identified by the broad collective, that pattern gets front run. So right now you got to ask yourself, is next year's bull run, the four year cycle getting front run by markets that learn? Um, this, that's not, this is no formal proof or anything, but it is an important thing that we need to keep in the back of our minds here as we go forward. Um, but that's not to say that there's not more gains on the way. We'll talk about it later. I do think there are more gains on the way. But um, but yes, like they do this. This is a play that they've done regularly. They find ways to hit Monero's price, to fuck with price, to shut down withdrawals, to do whatever they can do while they pump the rest of the markets. Right there, this is a relative smash. Right, they want to suppress Monero down as much as they can while they pump everything else so that Monero doesn't get any spotlight. So that everyone says to themselves, "Oh, you shouldn't hold Monero when there's a bull market. It it performs the worst." So they're going to try and make that reality enough so that the rest of the plebs and the rest of like the the market um, will adopt that mentality and then finish the job, right? Like that's just, that's how they do things. Um, the, the, because their power isn't like, they don't have omnipotent power. They can't control prices omnipotently, but they can control them significantly enough um, to sort of form the psychology, the market psychology necessary to get the results they want. Okay, so I just wanted to say that before I forget, um, because there's a good chance I'll forget somewhere in, in the maze of, of all the price things we're gonna talk about here. Um, Okay, so Monero, you'll notice we've, we've got the uh, the long term. This is the day, the daily chart going back to um, the beginning of 2023. You'll notice that our standard deviation bands have been very stable. Um, we crashed out of it, but now we're like back into those same bands. So um, we're not quite back up here, you know, 172, which would be really where we should be. Um, we're, we're basically getting just back into those bands, but this is a really good sign. The fact that we crashed down and then immediately rebound into them, that that's a good sign that price has no place being down here. This is not where the real price of Monero is. That's not where the real price of Monero is going. If it was, 
we would come up here and then we would crash down again. If we crash down again, I would say our price is pretty fucked. Um, but I don't think that's what's going to happen. This chart right now is signaling to us that that um, that Monero's real price, its real fair market value, is at least inside of these bands, um, and that probably incorporates all the fractional reserve that's been baked into the price over the past few years as well. So the the real fair market price, like a, a rational organic market price of Monero, would be definitely uh, many multiples higher. We we should really probably be. It, Easily at three five hundred dollars, if not higher. Um, okay, law. but anyways, sir. Met counts mm. law three thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, I Have mean, really, like local Monero Street price is actually uh, yeah. one fifty two. It's like ten dollars above. I, the, I um, saw like one seventy. I saw it at like one seventy somewhere. Yeah, I don't think that was. I think that was from like a while ago. Yeah, because I looked. Worth... I looked, and it was saying one fifty two. It's worth noting too that um, Coin Market Cap was misreporting Monero's price by like ten percent lower than than what every other exchange, even the scam exchanges, were 10%? reporting. Ten percent? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like when Monero spiked That's up, um, I don't know, is it like one thirty or one forty or something? They were reporting it down like one twenty. I just remember there being some tweets about it, and I looked it up, and I was like, motherfuckers. Of course, right? Of course, they're gonna do it. Um, so. Yeah, we're basically back in back in our bands, back in our stablecoin price before they did their fuckery. Um, okay, right. That's uh, it is what it is. This is the um, this is the uh, price divergences. Poloniex, for whatever reason, they just love to list Monero at five to six percent lower than even than the rest of the exchanges uh, tend to do. So, yeah, they, I don't know. They're just. They're out to lunch. I don't even know why I include them. I guess it's just a G Wiz kind of thing. Bitfinex. Bitfinex is, um, has also been enjoying uh, putting Monero's price about half a percent lower for a period of time than, uh, than what Kraken does. Um, we haven't looked at the volume weighted exchanges. We're not going to do that. I need to actually, um, I need to include Tether into these, into the volume weighted exchanges. I'm not sure how much we should trust the volume weighted stuff anymore. They just, I just don't trust volumes when it comes to crypto. But, anyways, that's what the uh, the absolute price divergences look like. Um, we're still we're doing this kind of like um, this like kind of one two three bounce bottom here thing. Um, let's take a look at the Z scores. My guess is that the Z scores are going to be showing us divergence here, which, um, yeah, basically. Um, Basically, the Z scores are making higher lows, whereas you know crypto kind of made or crypto Monero um, made a lower low here, and then now looks like it's. I mean, this looks like a bottoming pattern, guys. Uh, that that definitely looks like a bottoming pattern. Same thing with um, with XMR BTC. Uh, in fact, in a, in a very technical sense, you do have um, divergence to the RSI. Uh, let's draw a line here. So you'll notice that uh, that's a lower low, and if we're looking at it on terms of the close price, um, that was another lower low made uh, just a few days ago. All the while, the RSI, which is a, a momentum kind of indicator, uh, is making higher lows. So that's bullish divergence. Technically speaking, that would be bullish divergence on the price. Um, you know, for all the the TA degens, all the tea leaf degens. Um, again, when you look at technical analysis, it's like you don't want to just look at one thing and be like, "This is the thing," right? You, you got to look at the whole. Like, you really want to look at as many things as you can, and then see where you get confluences. Um, which means that you're not going to take trades that often, right? You're not necessarily going to get involved in a lot of trades. And I think that this is a theme that I've seen with a lot of successful traders. If you trade a lot, it better be algorithmic in nature. You better have well-defined criteria and you better be looking across a lot of different charts all the time and have access to, to basically a centralized exchange or a centralized marketplace where you that has the liquidity for you to take positions in a, in a very algorithmic sense. If you're not trading algorithmically, and you're trading kind of like like I do, where you're like, okay, let me look at the markets, let me see what I think. Let's take in the full spectrum of um, you know market psychology, fundamentals, um, technical analysis, and uh, you know the, the the news and what's happening. Right? If you're going to trade like that, my opinion is you really shouldn't trade that much. You need to limit your trades, and you need to take trades that you have confidence in, that you feel like there's a big confluence. It means you have to be comfortable with letting opportunities pass you by. Um, and we'll again, we'll talk a little bit more about like trading strategy a little bit later here. But um, yeah, so anyways, uh, this definitely looks in a technical sense like a bottoming pattern um, for Monero versus Bitcoin and Monero versus Ethereum, um, which, you know, hypothetically, that that could also be an indicator of um, of an altcoin run uh, about to happen or, uh, you know, kind of a, a market topping action um, that could be that could be happening here. Um, so there's really, there's not too much to say about Monero's prices. As usual, we're back into our, um, back into our stable coin range here. Probably this thing will keep going to the upside at, at this moment. The best thing that like 
we really want to get back to the to the 172 180 range we want to get back to these standard deviations here probably before this so we are looking at the monero transactions um lately we've had a little bump up here to the uh, 30 40,000 area which is nice last time we this is slightly longer than in december when that happened and if we zoom out a little bit now at the three-year chart um we're finally we're not we're not exactly getting up to um these kind of levels that we had centered around july of 2022 but in the depths of the bear market um you know at the end of october there um, we have been steadily having higher lows. So that's nice. Um, it looks like, you know, there's there's kind of a, a little bit of a comeback here. Uh, let's do a simple moving average of, uh, I guess, seven days is fine. Yeah, so you can see overall, like, we're kind of, um, that that bottom area is, is coming, coming to the top side here. And we're, although we've kind of flattened off here in the past few years, um, you know, if I were to put this on a technical analysis sense, you, you'd probably say that this is a consolidation pattern before going higher. Uh, at least hopefully, right? That's 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 the narrative I would like to tell myself that um, that we're basically going to be continuing um, our rise in transaction counts here. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think that's about it for Monero. Let's um, let's circle back around here and, and talk a little bit more about Bitcoin, um, a little bit about crypto. Let's see. We covered the ETF. Um, today we're going to talk the regression analysis. So let's go ahead and um, and get that done here. So uh, here's the monthly chart. Uh, there's a few things that are important to point out on the monthly chart. Oh, I redid the regression analysis um, for the yellow line. So the blue line or the green line or the aqua line, the, the lower boundary here, um, that's pretty much set. We won't recalculate that um, probably. Maybe I could recalculate it and include this data right here from January. But I still think it's very possible that um, at some point here in the next year or so, um, a big drop could happen, right? If you get some demand-destroying event, we could get another wick down that touches this lower boundary line. I really, really actually hope that happens. I would love the opportunity to, to say this is statistical maximum opportunity here um, to just put everything into Bitcoin or everything into crypto. It probably would be like a little Bitcoin, a little Ethereum, right? I'd probably just go with the big ones, whatever, um, on the cash I have waiting on the sidelines here. Um Okay, but the yellow line changes regularly because the yellow line is calculated by removing these blow-off tops. And it's an iterative process where you you sort of draw the regression line, the best fit line for all of the data, and then you throw out all of the data that's, you know, that's kind of like really, really high. Then you redraw the regression line without that data included. And then again, you cut off the tops. Maybe one day on the show when it's slow and there's not much to talk about, I'll actually like show you step by step this process, how it works. Ultimately, what I'm I say all that because this yellow line gets recalculated at every single new candle, right? Every single new candle causes this yellow line to shift ever so slightly. So once every few months, it it's really, um, it's not a bad idea to recalculate it. So this yellow line is now current as of February 28th, um, 2024. So you'll notice that, um, you know, I mean, it's really, if you're really looking at the Bitcoin price, like it is not significantly out of trend um, relative to the regression analysis, right? Relative to the non-bubble, I call the yellow line the non-bubble regression analysis. I kind of stole that from Ben Cohen, so thanks, Ben, for uh, the terminology. Definitely give him some credit there. Although, Ben, bro, if you ever come across this stuff, um, you should contact me. I can help you look at your residuals and get your model tightened up, which is which is why your model tends to diverge slowly over time. Um, at any rate, um, another important thing here to point out that you'll notice, I dropped this horizontal line. Effectively, Bitcoin closed the month of February um, at the previous close all-time all time high, right, from, uh, from October. Um, it effectively tagged that. Another very interesting thing to note here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six green candles in a row on the monthly chart, and we are now at seven green candles, although obviously we still have the next 30 uh, 30 days of March, 31 days of March um, before this green candle um, could potentially, you know, could go down. The thing that I want to point out here is that Bitcoin has never had seven months of green candles in a row since um, since 2012. And even this one right here. So, OK, we can count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 2012 was the last time Bitcoin had seven green monthly candles in a row. Um, and you almost... It, it almost doesn't count because these first two candles were really, they technically they were green, but basically they were flat, right? Like, okay, you count those technically, but they, that wasn't like actually like truly like positive movement. Okay, technically slightly, but it was more like a bottoming pattern after a big blow off top happened, a uh, consolidation pattern um, before moving higher. 
So um, that like that's another little like tick mark in our brains that we say, hey, you know, maybe this run is getting a little bit ahead of itself. That's not to say that things can't continue higher. And right now you'll see that the upper boundary of the Bitcoin regression sits at $140,000, right? Like if we got to $140,000, I would be taking massive shorts on leverage. I would take the risk of being on a centralized exchange to take shorts on the Bitcoin price if we touch this um, this upper boundary here again. I don't think we're necessarily going to get that high. Um, that's That would be really quite out of control, I think. Um, and even just the fact, again, that we've got these seven, well, six green candles working on the seventh here. Um, I mean, there's a lot of indicators out there, guys, that are starting to say top, top is close, top is inbound. We've got all these like small things again, you know, like with the Monero delisting, right? They did the same thing in 2021 where they delisted from Bitrex and then topped the markets and distributed on everyone, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit afterwards. Um, we're, we're on the Z scores, right? We are out of trend. We are nearing, as we talked about, um, back here, um, effectively, sorry, that's the stocks. This is, this is total market cap. Um, it, it's basically the same story for Bitcoin. Um, so again, effectively, like we're approaching out of trend. We are approaching the same levels as previous all time highs. Um, at least in terms of, you know, the, the previous, uh, 365 days. Okay, yeah. 365 days. So like you can see, like, we're basically getting like, we're close guys. Like this is getting close. Like I said, I've been I've been looking for opportunities to sell. I've been like uh, for the past few months, I'm like, hey, I'm ready to get out of these markets when the time comes. Time hasn't come yet. Um, so we're you know, I'm still basically long. Right. Um, as we've talked about this here, like the direction is up. I, there's there's more juice to squeeze. Right. This like you don't want to get out of the markets yet. Um, and again, I really want to sidetrack here into like trading styles and strategies. But we're, we'll we'll save that here for for a little bit. Um, let's go back to the regression analysis. OK, so that's the monthly. Um, that's what the monthly chart looks like. Let's go down to the daily. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there's anything we need to look at on the daily there, actually. Uh, let's take a, a quick, um, side trail as long as we're on it. Um, tether market cap has like massively increased. So there's been a lot of tethers issued. And actually this is kind of a miss on my part, guys. I should have, I should have been watching this more carefully and just kind of like, I don't know, I guess I got bored of looking at the tether market cap, not doing anything, but really starting in November, um, tether market cap really started moving to the upside. This is yet another like congruency to what happened in 2020, 2021. You saw tether market cap significantly increasing um, ahead of and in line with as Bitcoin price increased. So um, at the moment, like tether market cap continues to move up, right? Like that's that's gone from 82 billion to almost 100 billion, right? So that's um, that's 18 billion more uh, more tether uh, in existence now. So and also USDC market cap bottomed in and is now also moving to the upside here. So. Um, just another like important small point to to keep keep in our heads here. Um, let's go to like our regular charts that we look at. And uh, if I'm looking for areas where I think topping action could happen, this is the Bitcoin chart. It is now significantly above like any of our uh, our eyeball lines. We are now actually significantly um, breaking through these upper standard deviations. Those upper standard deviations had been a target in my mind for quite a long time. But the reality is that. There's so much momentum here um, that that momentum is just continuing to carry this thing higher and higher. And in a lot of ways, that's dangerous, right? Because that's leverage. When this kind of thing happens, people start aping in. People start taking leverage. They start going 20x. They start doing crazy shit. And that shit just pumps the coin even more. So right now, what we're looking at here is these purple bands. And that's um, that's a derivation of standard deviation. It's like kind of your next level up. It's not the second standard deviation. It's like a... It's a non-arbitrary way. It's a non-multiplier way of deciding how do you look at um, how do you look at standard deviation and a moving standard deviation, and then come up with something that gives you um, something useful, right? Um, right now, I'm looking at this as being the potential topping point for Bitcoin. I, I don't want to say that that's that's what I think the topping point will be, but 80k somewhere around about 80,000 now is is what this really looks like. That looks quite possible. Again. You've got liquidity in the macro sense that's still available. You still got stock markets that are going to that are going to continue up most likely. Um, does it need to cool off? Yeah, I mean that that could be the case. I don't know if things are going to cool off or continue directly up. Um, but uh, but at the moment, I really do think that um, eighty thousand could be could could legitimately be a spot to look for here. I mean that's what that's what the technicals would say. Like that's what um that's what the chart looks like. Um, so uh, you know I still like. I still am not going to chase with the funds I've had sitting on the sideline. I just don't chase. I hate chasing. It's like, I just can't do it. I will watch the market pass me by. That's fine. And, and miss out on some gains that I could have had. 
Um, you know, like I've talked, told you guys, I've still got my long plays on my on my altcoins, and those are keeping pace with Bitcoin, um, and in a lot of cases, in some cases, outperforming significantly. So, um, yeah, I mean, this thing could continue going. I think it would just be special if you know, sixty five thousand, seventy thousand. 80,000, right? Like marginally higher highs to trick people into thinking that the next wave up, the next big, you know, boom is coming um, only to distribute on the plebs and then, and then see some kind of big washout. So um, again, that's tentative, like to say that we're going to have some interim top here and then have a big washout, you know, maybe back down to like 30 K or, or 40 K, something like that. Um, you know, that's very speculative, right? We're looking into the future. And so this is what I mean when I say this is a tentative kind of idea we have to examine as we get closer. We have to play it by ear in real time um, because like markets are not static. And if you have some kind of thesis where you think the market, um, you know, you're looking ahead. OK, this is what I expect the market's going to do. Here's how I will position myself for that. As as things change and as like the markets dynamically adjust and update um, and things will always happen that you don't expect, you need to be nimble to adjust to that. Right. Like just because I've been saying, hey, I'm looking for exits. I haven't exited yet, right? Like, and that's that's an important thing to understand. Like, when you're listening to anyone talk about price, or anyone like making forecasts, right? Like, um, this is a fuzzy thing, and and it's you can't get it right all the time. And you, if you're going to trade, you especially have to know that you're going to be wrong sometimes, and be able to survive um, being wrong, right? So, um, that's um, you know, personally, like my style is I I I hate trend trading, I hate chasing, um, but I do like trying to buy tops and uh, sell tops and buy bottoms. Um, that seems to have worked for me. Like personally, that's worked pretty good. Um, I'm okay with watching the markets pump and I'm not hundred percent in the market. Um, that's fine. Uh, I, I trade lightly and I trade rarely. Like there are times that opportunity comes along, right? With the, with the delisting, there was good opportunity there to like to sit all day and watch a chart and then try and time the bottom, right. And, and buy some an arrow at the bottom there. Um, that was, that was fun. That was cool. Um, but I, uh, you know, I've got other projects that I work on. I, I really don't want to be married to a screen, to a chart. I really um, have come to dislike that in a significant amount. So if you're not going to dedicate all your time to looking at charts and studying markets, um, you need to find other ways. If you want to trade and you want to beat the market and not just hodl, you need to find strategies that are going to work for you, right? So for me personally, keeping track of the macro situation, trying to buy the bottom, selling the top, or at least getting in that neighborhood, right? Um, has helped me to be able to, to beat the market fairly consistently now for, for the past couple of years. Um, but that's just my personal style. There's other styles that work, right? So that's why I don't, I try not to tell you guys and give like specific advice or like you should do this or like you should, I mean, yeah, so okay. The market direction is up. I think things are going up, but I typically won't like tell you, okay, this is like how you should trade your exact strategy or style. This is why I'm just trying to like deliver the information of what the markets look like, at least from my perspective, um, so that you can make your own decision in line with your own like trading goals and objectives with your own like, um, financial investment, uh, goals and objectives. So, um, cause I, you know, lately I've had a lot of people asking me this question, like, Hey man, um, the market's going up. I'm going to sell my stocks and buy the Bitcoin ETF. And I'm just like, you know, rubbing my eyes. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you guys. Like, that's why back in December, January, uh, a year ago, right at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, I said, you know, this is the time the macro situation is clearly changing. There's a fundamental shift happening. Like now is the time to get back into the markets, like start buying. Um, because Right now, I don't care if markets drop. Like I can hold all of the things I'm holding and the markets can drop and I'm still winning. I'm still in profits. But if I go chasing right here and I drop all that cash, you know, the extra like, I don't know, stable coins or, or gold or whatever, if I drop that into crypto markets now and then I'm wrong and things don't continue going up to 80,000 and I like that's loss, that's pure loss. So I don't know what to tell people that are, that are like, hey, you know, should I put my money into the Bitcoin ETF now? It's like I, I couldn't like that's that's completely out of line with the way that I trade. There is a trend, however, um, some people do trend trade, just know that like, that's a very different style. Um, so hopefully, uh, I don't know, it sounds like a little bit of a, um, disclaimer, I guess, but, um, really it's, it's contextual. Like I, I want you guys to understand the context for the information that I'm presenting and, um, and, and hopefully like just know you have to integrate that into your own like goal strategy styles and availability to trade these markets. So, um, yeah, that's, um, let's see. Let's make sure we've covered everything here. Similar chart patterns. Yeah, yeah, we won't cover that chart pattern. We already covered the regression analysis. Um, Bitcoin NASDAQ looks very similar. Um, let's see here. Bitcoin NASDAQ is already like kind of moving to the upside here. Again, you've got these big purple lines um, at the top side here. That That's probably a good target. Um, Bitcoin has been significantly outperforming the NASDAQ. Although you'll notice like Bitcoin is still pretty far away from its all-time highs in terms of the NASDAQ. Let's go to the monthly. These are monthly candles. 
Yeah, I mean, so Bitcoin is still like, and this is kind of like, this is almost kind of a good way to look at Bitcoin relative to inflation because the NASDAQ um, probably is like the biggest beneficiary of inflation. It really is. Like you get all this liquidity, you get all the speculation, this money printing, you get the leverage, you get people taking loans to invest into the market, right? And then what do they invest in? Because times are good, they go into the NASDAQ because that's your, you know, that's that's where the gains are to be had in the, in the traditional markets. So if you really want to look at how Bitcoin is doing relative to inflation, you probably want to look at Bitcoin relative to the NASDAQ. Um, so, I mean, it's doing pretty good, right? Like Bitcoin is now like beaten the most, pretty much the most shallow way that we could draw this line. Like, okay, maybe we could try and draw the line like that. Like we could try and draw the line like that. That would be dubious. But um, anyways, like Bitcoin is doing quite well relative to the NASDAQ. So um, I think that's about all I, I have for you guys. It's been quite a long price report today. So um, yeah, just to no summarize, worries. just to okay. summarize the macro situation still looks like there's liquidity, the stock market, technical analysis, um, statistical, you know, standard deviation analysis looks like it still wants to make it higher. Uh, it still wants to go up. Bitcoin is now well beyond, uh, like it has momentum. Crypto has momentum. There's real cash coming in with the ETF, although some of that is wash trading, no doubt. Bitcoin is now well above standard deviation levels. Um, that's probably a pivot point. I, I'm looking at tentatively 80K now, um, a, a slightly higher high for Bitcoin. Um, and I still do think that at some point an altcoin run, um, and there kind of already is, like it's already happening. There already is kind of an altcoin run in progress. Um, maybe not for like Ethereum, right? Ethereum isn't making any big runs, but um, like some of these other coins like uh, Link and AVAX and, um, you know, like there, there are coins out there that are doing quite well. Not all of them are, but there should be some kind of altcoin run. Um, pick and choose wisely. I say when it comes to small market cap, highly speculative plays, it is never wrong to take profit. If you're holding shit coins and you're speculating on shit coins and you're up, you know, significant amounts, if you significantly outperform Bitcoin, it's never wrong to take profit. Um, I say take that profit. If you really like feel like you need to keep it in crypto, okay, then take the profit on the shit coin and go into Bitcoin, go into Ethereum, go into Monero, right? Go into go into something else. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's like the big broad the the 30,000 foot view like there's still liquidity altcoin run probably coming somewhat it might be muted it might not be as big as people hope but um you know um don't get too greedy i feel greedy right now i look at my emotions and i think that my emotions are a counter signal um <laughs> the market can stay greedy for a while though so I, I know um, I've asked you this before, buddy, but just real quick, what is your advice to people that are looking to, you know, perhaps liquidate some of their crypto into a quote unquote stable, something uh, USD related? What's the easiest way you think these days to do that in a KYC free, free way? Uh, if you're there's there's local Monero, so, but you, that means you already have to have, have your Monero. Um, these these um, instant swap exchanges are pretty good. Um, there's there's basic swap, but that didn't seem to have a significant um, like selection of coins. Um, I say trocador.app is a really good way to KYC free get from one coin um, into another coin. So, yeah, I mean, you can go straight from whatever shit coin it is you're gambling on into USDC or USDT um, or die and or die. Those are my big three. Those are the ones that I prefer to hold. They're stable, right? Like if you... If you tried to do Terra Luna stablecoin, like you got totally wrecked and wiped out, um, you know, stay with stay with the tried and true ones. Like USDT has some kind of like tacit blessing or agreement with the deep state, um, you know. But stay with stay with like the big three there. Um, you can use instant swap exchanges. That's a non KYC way to do it. What else could you do? Um, let's see. I, I mean, you could see what 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 kind of stuff exists on local Monero. You could hypothetically swap from your shitcoin into XMR. And then from XMR into Ethereum or into Tron, and then from there into USDC. I know that I'm hoop jumping here, so I, I apologize. But there's there's not like as you were talking about Monero earlier, there's not great ways. Like it's not a straightforward click a button um, easy way to do it. You've got to jump through some hoops to 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 do this sometimes. Vic is saying, yeah, obviously you can swap into stables and kick, and that yep, probably we have is and door in cake the easiest way to do it. What are the fees there? Um, I don't know if there are any, I don't know how much different they are from using Trigger by itself. I don't think it's, I don't think it's any different at all. I think it's the same. Okay. I remember uh, one time I, I, I swapped, I swapped, I think it was BTC to Monero or like Litecoin to Monero or something. And I, I felt like I was paying 4% or like 5%. I was like, damn, that's kind of high. 
But that was before y'all integrated Trocador, so maybe I need to take a second. It was probably with one of the other ones because there's also Change Now, Side Shift, and Simple Swap, um, which those ones have all slightly different fee rates. Trocador, though, it also depends on which service Trocador selects because Trocador themselves is an aggregator uh, for a lot of different swap services, right? So depending on which one you get in Trocador, that'll also change the, the fee. Hmm. I just remember it was like it was a simple interface. I was like, okay, I want to swap from here to here. I don't remember which direction exactly, but it involves Monero. And I just remember paying like four or five percent in fees, and I didn't have much. Like there wasn't really an option. It was like, okay, would you want to? Do you want to swap? And I was like, yes, I want to swap. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Write down this thing. Okay, it's written. And then once everything was said and done, I was like, damn, that was a four percent hit or like a five percent hit. Um, I don't think I've ever paid a fee that now. high. Somebody's saying okay. average one point five percent fee in cake. I don't yeah. know what. Which I've never, I've never, to, yeah, okay. I've never paid a fee that it's high. Usually, like saying 1% around one percent, it should be. Uh, we do huge volume, so obviously people are good. Okay, that must have just been go, like guys. an there off experience, go. and it was last year. Like, it was, I think it was early last year. So it's been a while um, since I've done it. But yeah, once again, it'll it vary it depending easy. on like, the. You um, poops. Yeah, no, it's just built in there, um, and the whole exchange process is integrated in the wallet, so you don't have to leave it, which is pretty awesome. But uh, it'll it vary depending on the provider, it. but uh, I think I've paid around 1% for all the swaps I've done, around 1% to 2%. Well, Definitely gee, not I'm gonna start using I, th I, think they were, I think they were a hot, much higher back in the day when it first started, I remember, like when um, you, know, you were first able to use an instant exchange on Cake. The fees were higher back in the day. I believe I could, you know, that was that was my experience, talking years ago. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's good to hear. Then actually, I don't know now though. Know. Honestly, I haven't made a sw I haven't uh, used it anytime recently. But I, it, Vic is saying around one percent, which is you know that's that's very competitive, right? Yeah, and that reflects my own experience. Yeah. Well, I will I will give it a try again. The next time I need to make a swap, I'll just do do it in cake and um. Um, yeah, if that if that happens again, I'll definitely contact you, Vic. Let you know, um, and and so, Tux. So. All right, awesome body, fantastic price report as always. Thank you.